Okay, right. ready to talk about this article? Do I have the right article? Yeah, that's <laughs> our I don't want to be talking about two different articles. That, that would be really confusing. So you shared, you shared this article with me, Jason, and uh, great to be back with you to talk some more. Uh, we've been talking about some interesting things, but this article that you sent to me, Preparing Our Hearts for Exile, we're going to talk about that tonight. Uh, give some things we liked, maybe some th maybe some pushback on the article too. Uh, just go back and forth on it, but also uh, talk a little bit about John MacArthur, his church's situation. Uh, we might mention that a little bit too. And to kind of kick things off, I actually uh, did want to kind of tie in here with um, John MacArthur's situation because the writer of this article said something really interesting. Uh, he said, our society is developing a precedent for dictating the terms of worship services. The rationale might be particularly compelling right now. Will it be as compelling in the future? Uh, so I think that what he's talking about there uh, definitely ties into uh, what's happening with MacArthur's situation. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can talk more about this article in depth, but I just wanted to mention that, you know, with what John MacArthur is going through, uh, it really is exactly what that writer is talking about. You know, you have a situation where society is dictating how we can worship. And, you know, a lot of people, of course, are looking at it from the angle of, are we being safe? Are we doing things right. in a safe manner? And that's a perfectly legitimate question to ask. But a bigger question from, from our Christian standpoint is who is in charge of determining how to act safely? And there is a balance, of course. The government can try to protect us, but there also comes a point at which they're overstepping their bounds. Uh, and, you know, it's kind of what's been called the nanny state, uh, yep. where they, they start to take care of us so much that we're not re really responsible anymore for ourselves the way that we should be. And as Christians, we see, this is really the article's point, the, the article we're talking about here, which I will leave a link to uh, in the description of the video so people can read the article for themselves. But really, uh, the point is that we are losing the sway and, and the uh, ability to influence culture the way that we used to as Christians. So he's really kind of getting us to think about being prepared for living in a culture that no longer affords us the influence that we used to have. Mm -hmm. So and, that's just a little background. Go ahead. No, and, and just because that's actually one of his points in the article that um, he mentions as it relates to Christians shooting for political influence rather than um, spiritual influence in their communities. And I think that's perfect example like if we've tried so long we tried so hard to be to get people to behave properly without actually being converted and now we see they then he mentions it also in the article how we've tried so hard to be liked by society society never did like us and so now we are in this situation where they don't care what you're saying we don't want you to worship in the way that you um, see fit to worship and we feel like we can tell you that you can't do that so it is interesting to see um, I'm certainly praying for Dr. MacArthur tomorrow as his um, case mm -hmm. actually comes up just that the right thing will be done but no matter what that, that the, the gospel will get out because eventually um, it's becoming a little bit more clear and evident in the last so many weeks that you know what our freedoms are not guaranteed to us anymore or what we see as our freedoms are not guaranteed to us especially in light of the coronavirus but um. that's great that's great and i think it's it's a it's kind of a, a positive uh as well as the negative because we hate to lose the the freedoms or the things that we have been accustomed to we've been so blessed and privileged in this culture as christians mm -hmm. but as we lose that there is still the blessing 
uh, of, of what Jesus said. He said, blessed are the persecuted. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. So there's actually a blessing when we lose that influence and clout because uh, Christians throughout history have known what it's like uh, to, to not be in the mainstream and to yeah, not have yeah. the power. And it's actually in those situations that I think we can often shine out even brighter in our testimony for the Lord. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. You want to talk about three things that you liked and three things that you maybe didn't like, or how do you want to break it down? Yeah, I think uh, you, you told me you had a few things that you liked about the article uh, and then you also had kind of a couple of meh is the way you put it, just things <laughs> in, not necessarily disagree with, but just maybe not quite as on board with or something. But yeah, yeah I'd like yeah. to hear, I'd like to hear you kick it off a little bit here. Well, the article has several different subsections. And one of the subsections is titled, we drew the lines in the wrong places. And one of the parts that he mentions, and I do encourage our are your watchers and your subscribers to actually go to the article and read it in its entirety because it's a very insightful article. Um, but this is just something I want to start with some things that maybe I didn't I didn't like them that, that much. And here's one of them. The result was in some ways predictable and in other ways unanticipated. And what he had been referring to is that we were trying to make cultural changes rather than spiritual changes. Christians particularly white Christians, became so identified with one party that they largely lost their influence with people who identified with any other party or the other party. And I thought his point was great that, um, you know, you're, you're pro-life, so it kinda, you kind of lean toward one group or you're pro-supporting um, a, a welfare system and you want a robust single-pay health care system, so you might lean toward another party. I didn't like the fact that he pointed out only white people because mm. many people groups lean toward certain parties just because of certain aspects of what they're looking for. So in Christendom, it's no different. So there's, you know, black Christians are predominantly seen as a democratic party or democrat supporting people, people group. I, I didn't think that pointing out white people necessarily had to happen because this is true in any people group, if you're lean, if they, in Christian, if they lean so heavy on certain aspects of the culture of the society that they want to mm -hmm. change, they are going to get kind of lumped in with a particular party. And that was just mm -hmm. something that just kind of like, eh, you didn't need to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, one of the things I liked about the article uh, is at one point he was really talking about how we need to pray. We need to be people of prayer as we're preparing to be less influential or have the upper hand in our culture as Christians, uh, one of the answers to that, which we should, we should know anyway, we should be a people of prayer. Yes. And he did talk about praying for all political leaders uh, yes. regardless. And I think that's so pivotal right now. If you are of a certain uh, political persuasion, you need to always remember to pray for your leaders. The Bible doesn't say pray for the leaders of your political persuasion. <laughs> it no, says right. to pray for all leaders. I really appreciated that. And I agree with you. I think sometimes we forget that everybody, it, it, you know, whatever background you are, whatever ethnicity you are, uh, you, you, you're probably in a group that leans a certain way. And it's yeah. easy to look at everything through that lens and to let that override actually the principle that the Bible gives which is that uh, all leaders need our prayer. And we may really have a hard time with some leaders, mm -hmm. but Absolutely. I think prayer puts us in the right disposition um, so that, of course, we can criticize and there's a place for criticism, uh, but we need to do it humbly and we need to look beyond those leaders to our true leader, the one who is sovereign over all. And so I thought that was a really good reminder in that article. I agree. Here's another thing, Tim, that I thought was like, eh, it didn't really strike out to me. And this is, again, if you look in the, in the article, it's under section one, which is we focus our energies on politics rather than culture. And actually, I was kind of torn about this one because I actually I've said this before, and I'm just going to read this section and you'll see what I mean. 
A funny thing happened on our way to shaping the culture through politics. It was ultimately culture that reshaped Christians through their political engagement. For example, to the breakdown of the individual families and communities rather than the breakdown of the family in general, we would have had more opportunities to counteract the corrosive changes in culture. Moving on to the next portion of this, the so-called culture wars left much of American Christianity sapped of strength out of touch with the broader culture and more cynical and worldly in our own values. And here's the part that I really thought made the point. Christians care more about power than service, political change more than heart change, favor more than fidelity. And I just added the point that basically the, the unbelieving world sees that Christians have abandoned the Great Commission. So my, in, rather than trying to be faithful in the Great Commission, we've tried to be political in this political world and it's actually reshaped us and changed us, how we interact with one another and how the church is viewed rather than the church is faithful to its, its commission. It's just doing whatever the world does. We, just, we respond with the world rather than doing what we've been told to do. But um, it was hard for me to say I didn't really like that one, but that was just one that didn't really sit as well. You got anything? Yeah. So are you saying that you agree with him on that point? I, I thought that's what I heard you saying. Oh, I agree with him on that point. And I think the, the main reason why I, I said it's like, meh, is because it's what I saw as macro versus micro. We talked about that before, trying to get the most bang for our buck in our preaching, most bang for our buck in our evangelism and realizing that it's really one-on-one. -on -one. It's really small group. It's really some small relationships that are going to help one person, maybe two people or a small family move along the continuum and growing in Christ rather than trying to make this big change. And really, I think Christians have kind of got caught up in making that big change rather than recognizing we make small changes. So like I said, that one really wasn't fair because I do kind of agree with them, but um, I had to have, you know. You, you were trying to look for something to not totally agree with. I, I got you. I got you. Oh, yeah, because my, my positives, I'm all over the place with my positives. And actually, those are <laughs> so, my two so, that I didn't. Go so ahead. it's a really hard, harder for you to limit your, your positives because you have a lot more than, than just two or three. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I like what you're saying. Um, I think it reminds me of the early church, how very early on they, they were the outcasts. They were the outsiders. And then they started to actually have so much impact in Roman culture. You think of what happened with Constantine by that time period and how it changed their political standing. Right. And, you know, once Christians have the political upper hand, that that has its own challenges. Yeah, it's that, it's that not always sense. easy, actually, when, when you have more power and authority in a culture. Um, and so I think we, we do sometimes crave that political power. We always have to look at what is it doing to us. That's really important. There is a balance, though. Um, I was actually thinking about it as I read the article that I, I think we have to be thinking about our culture situation in a, in a realistic way. And, and I appreciate that with what he said, because I think he's trying to be a realist. I would push back a little bit on him, though, that we're, we're not to be fatalist and we're not to just remove ourselves. And I think that's the tension for, for Christians. Many groups have said, we're just going to get out of politics. I think of the Amish, yes. um, that generally speaking, they're, they're kind of their own thing. Although I, I did see some Amish buggies that had Trump flags, I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's, I, I saw that pictures of that. <laughs> But, you know, as Christians, um, we, we have that difficult thing that we have to balance. We, one way I would put it is we want to be, uh, be prepared. Um, we, we do want to make sure that we, we do our best to, um, to, to, to try to be an influence in the culture, to be salt and light. Um, and so we don't want to be just resigned to whatever happens happens uh it doesn't matter i can just you know totally stay out of politics 
and uh, just do my own thing over here. I, I personally think that we can become fatalistic. And in our country, we actually do have a great, uh, it's a privilege to, mm -hmm. to be able to have a voice in our culture. So I hope I'm explaining this clearly, but as Christians, we have to keep it balanced because I don't want to make politics too big of a thing. And I don't want it to shape the way I look at everything. I want Christ to be first, but I still want to be a responsible citizen because I am also placed here by God at this time as, as an American citizen. Mm -hmm. I love it. So I'm going to talk about the things I really liked in the article. And I think you kind of gave me a great segue into it. Part four is we have confused God's gracious providences with his saving promises. Um, and I'll just read it because I think he made such a fantastic point. And it's point four in the article. I think this last issue is the most personally convicting for many of us. Our lives are hidden in Christ, in God, and that's Galatians 3. And that is where we would profess to find our identity, but it was also nice to have shared culture, cultural values with much of the population and to have such an elastic and resilient economy, the most in history. Oh, and don't forget about a system of checks and balances that curbed abuses and powers and the rule of law that helped us feel safe at night. All of these were gracious providences of the Lord. And here's the part that just stung me, but he never promised us any of those. So one of the things I kind of, to your point, um, we never were promised to be in power. We never were promised to have in, to have uh, cultural necessarily influence and the stuff and the such like that. Um, that's why the apostle Paul wrote, you know, you know, we are sojourners in this land. We're aliens and the such of that nature. And I think we've kind of forgotten that. We've gotten mm. kind of comfortable with things being so positive and so productive in our favor, if you will that the idea of it not being in our favor, the idea of it not being positive and productive for us now is kind of bothersome. But we have to remember, we weren't promised that. This is truly just God's providence, not a promise that we can hold on to. Promise we can hold on to is salvation in Christ, but not you know, a, a robust economy or a system of checks and balances that keeps us safe at night. Yeah, I think that's uh, yeah. that's good, and I like how he said um, that we need. And I'm going to quote him here. He says, "Repent daily, and if you don't think you need to repent, then you really need to repent." Uh, and so, <laughs> as as we're thinking about what's happening in our culture, it is so easy uh, to to look outside of ourselves and to always play the blame game. Uh, because that's that's human nature. Humans have been blaming others since the beginning. When God confronted Adam and Eve, what did they do? They they blamed, <laughs> right? Blame, blame, blame. You know. And I think we need to make sure, as Christians in this country, uh, that we're not in that mindset. I love that He's bringing out Christians are people of repentance, and yes. that means right now, we yes, we might not like the way our culture is going. But one of the things, we have to take a step back and say, where do you expect the world to go? Right. They're going to go in the wrong direction. It, it, and so we need to look at ourselves and, and, and be humble before God, praying for his mercy and his help in our lives. And then as, as he's working in us, we can have the right impact on our culture. So I did like that he he brought that out. Now, I do want to also mentioned that he said that God never promised to heal our land if we turned to him and sought his face. And I'm not sure I would put it that way because I understand that we're not Israel. And I think okay. maybe that's yeah. what he was saying. Mm -hmm. But I do think righteousness exalts a nation. I do think that when our country had so many Christians in it, God was blessing it. And uh, I do think in the Bible, you even see God honoring people outside of Israel that look to him. 
And so, uh, yeah, technically, I, I understand where he's coming from. But I think if America turns back to God, I think God will bless us. Uh, and so I, I don't, I feel like he's resigned himself a little bit to uh, America could never come back. We're just going to be, you know, outcasts now as Christians. Well, maybe, and we should be prepared. I agree with that. But maybe uh, America will be humbled by something and uh, we'll, we'll see revival, you know. So I, I, I would like to hold out hope for that. And I, I, I agree with you. <laughs> Only thing I, I think what when he wrote that about um, God never promised to heal our land, I think it's because Christians for for however long have just found key verses in scripture and just extract those as their promise and it's not in context and such like that. You definitely have a great point that if we do repent, then we could expect to see that, but we're not guaranteed it. But then also, I think it also pushes back on that idea that that replacement theology that America has somehow or another become Israel. Mm. Um, so I, that's what I think he's doing. But I don't think if we all sat down at a table, I don't think we would um, we would we would be at a great odds if we no. could talk with him about that. So that's yeah. it. But you you kind of stole some of my thunder, Tim. So I'm gonna have to take one of your baseball caps because you took my second one that I like was part of the same conversation you just said about repenting and it's toward the end of that section which is section one and it's titled um well is this um the present predicament of preparing for exile and it says at the end when the weather is good for christians in a culture we don't have to question the reliability of our anchor and he ends it by saying now we do and i, I thought about Hebrew 6, 17 through 20, um, where the writer says, so when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath so that by two unchangeable things, which is it is impossible for God to lie, we, do, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the eternal place, or rather the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as our forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So this is a great time for us to check our anchor. As things are getting bumpy, as things are getting maybe getting a little, waves are getting a little rocky, wind is getting a little bit up, maybe we should check our anchor, make sure that we're actually anchored in to Christ who's gone behind, beyond the curtain. Or are we relying on, you know, a good economy, good system of checks and balances, supposed justice in this land, so on and so forth? What am I leaning on? What is, what's anchoring me? So that was my second point, that... We should probably check our anchors right now. This would be a good time to do so. I love that. Um, and my last point was section two. Meditate on the sovereign, loving God of history. I think for, um, and I think for most of us, we just kind of think that Christianity started with us. I don't think we say it vo vocally, but it's like, hey, that's it. It started today when I got saved. It's, and we forget the fact that there's a long history of church history that we can lean on and we can look at and see that God has come through through various good things and bad things that people have done in the name of God, that have happened to the people of God, so on and so forth. Um, this is something that um, he mentioned in there. God's word is preeminently the the preeminent font of learning, church history, as well as its preeminent. And I think the more we reflect on church history, whether it be good or even bad, it helps us to see God through history and see how he moved through history. Because we can see it through the scriptures. We see how he moved through these people's lives, whether they were good people or bad people, whether they always did what he told them to do 
or they didn't. Oh, yeah, by the way, there's only one person who always did what he told me to do. But the, the idea that we can l- look at history and see how God moved through history, I think it's something that we should return to, we should go back to and look at, whether it be, again, good history or bad history. What you got? That's awesome. Yeah, I think you're right. We, um, we, we, we tend to operate out of what we're used to and what we've experienced. And for, for so many of us, we've, we've grown up with such privileges, you know, as Christians. Um, we, we've, we've had kind of a favored status. There's no doubt about it. But when you look at history, that is not the norm. Uh, Christians throughout history have suffered greatly, and actually not just in history, but even around the world. You think of Voice of the Martyrs, that organization, Mm -hmm. and the fact that they are always highlighting people that right now in the present go through so much for the name of, of Christ. And what are we experiencing? You know, our lives are really easy even at at, even at its worst it's usually pretty easy compared to what other people are going through so i love the 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 point you're bringing out about historical perspective and also i would add worldwide perspective making sure that we don't just become american centric in how we look at our faith in christ because jesus is uh, over his church throughout the world and these are brothers and sisters throughout the world that are suffering for the name of Christ. And I am I always feel like I am not worthy. You know how mm-hmm. Hebrews talks about of whom the world was not worthy. I look at some of our fellow brothers and sisters. And even though I've got this YouTube channel and I try to be edifying, I think compared to that person who has really suffered, who am I, you know, when it comes to my faith? Uh, they've, they've really demonstrated something that I just admire. And I know that's God's work in them. So I praise the Lord for that. It's his grace. But I, I do believe that there are people that go through so much more than we do. And we forget that. We, we really have it easy. So I'm going to give you one that I liked uh, based on that idea that w- we have to be ready for things that are not what we're used to. And I love, he gave a really good practical advice here, a a real practical thing. He said, prepare for economic detachment. And what he's talking about is as Christians, we've gotten used to looking to the government to give us their funds. Mm -hmm. So uh, he gave some examples, but I know in my area, we have a Christian school. My kids go to the Christian school. And I think that there are some government programs that, help the school out and we certainly as churches have been tax exempt and so what he's telling us is be ready as the culture changes be ready to not have those supports and luxuries if you will that we used to have in the past and that's a reminder we we tend to take these things in america as the norm well of course the government's going to protect what I believe in and is even going to give, uh, you know, some money to help, not necessarily. (laughs) And, uh, I think we need to be ready. Uh, you know, we don't know what will happen, but we definitely need to be ready for a time when we do not have, uh, the privileges and luxuries financially that we've had as Christian institutions. I think that's fantastic. Um, something I, I wrote down just kind of um, just to consider is being mindful that through the good times, the bad times and whatnot, Christ promised to build his church. And in the midst of you know, going back to reflecting over history and stuff like that, we can see that he's still building his church through all of these times, whether it be you know, prosperity. You know, we, we, we have a, a fantastic opportunity now to be educated, to, um, to learn, to be able to, to share the gospel pretty much any way we want to now. When things change and flip upside down, you know what? We've already been accustomed to how to do things. Now we can just do them differently. So I think we, we can rest in the fact that he's already said that he'll build his church. And we don't have to look at he, again, as we're looking at history, we see bad things. We're looking at history, we see things that weren't 
um, maybe not as kosher as we like them to be, we can say, hey, you know, Christ is still building his church, even in the midst of that, um, even in the midst of uh, bad times or things that didn't go right, or maybe even outright injustices. He still used that to build his church. Amen. I, I like what you said recently about how we, Christians need to make sure they're focused on discipleship uh, is mm -hmm. the term that you used. And I actually was thinking about this word. As, as this person, this article writer was talking about culture, it really always occurs to me that something is training us or discipling us or catechizing us, however you want to put that. Something is developing you. And um, one of the things that I think he kind of made it sound like is the culture is, and he kind of described it, but what's hard is our culture actually has different uh different streams running through it so you have uh you know i'll just use media as an example you have cnn mm -hmm. okay and then take fox news and then now i think you're starting to see uh, like newsmax on an even more conservative side of things so if you're a news watcher depending on what you choose to watch is going to influence how you think about things. Right. And so what's happening in our culture is we actually have fragmentation taking place. Mm -hmm. And as Christians, I think we need to make sure we don't fall into that trap of letting any one of those things become our predominant discipling and shaping force in our lives. We, we are taught that, we, you know, Jesus, when he gave the Great Commission, teach them to observe all things that I've commanded. The, the, the catechesis for us is Jesus Christ and his word. Mm -hmm. And I know we all know that as Christians, but oh, it yeah. gets us back to what we've talked about before. If we're watching the news more than we're reading the word, we're going to get thrown off. And so I think um, I would add to what he said that you know, there are things happening in our culture right now that are pulling our culture in different directions. And some of it is on the liberal side. Some of it is called mm -hmm. conservative. Whatever you call these things, they're pulling in all these different directions. And so we are, we are seeing our culture become more and more confrontational. But as Christians, if we're going to handle that oh, the right yeah. way, we actually have to step outside of that to some degree and we have to be catechized not by the movies, not by the news, not by even the, you know, you think about the education system. Our primary education needs to be found in the scripture and in Christ. And um, I know as Christians, we know this stuff. I, I realize that. But I, I just feel like it's tempting for Christians to uh to be shaped by something in this culture and uh so i think it gets back to what you said we need to make sure as we're dealing with the things happening right now that we are stronger and stronger in our discipleship and i think that ties into what you were just talking about as jesus builds his church and he is building his church mm -hmm. he builds it you know, on a spiritual level, and that's where our our hearts and minds need to be focused. I love it, and actually, that's what really uh, drew me to the article in the first place. Was it when it was preparing our hearts for exile? Just mm. recognizing that we have so many of these comforts, or so many creature comforts now that it's it, it's a catch twenty two. It's really easy to learn. We have access to more Bibles than anybody else, so on and so forth. But on the same note, we have so many more distractions, so many things that are keeping our attention. So we have to be mindful of that. I think that's the whole point of mm. this article yes. was preparing yourself to, you know, recognizing that we have idols, recognizing we've become super um, comfortable, recognizing these things and how to counteract those by reading his word, by praying for our leaders, by reflecting over church history and seeing God move. That is not all about me, that I'm a part of a body. I'm a part of an organism that, the head is Christ. So um, as, as we, hence why I brought this up to you, I thought it'd be great to discuss it, is just rec recognizing that 
as we're preparing ourselves for exile, we're mm-hmm. preparing ourselves, we're preparing our wives and our kids so that they too will be properly ready when things are not going the way that we, we want it to be or things are not going the way that we're used to. And we're not sitting there longing for the days of, you know, children of Israel brought into the wilderness. And they're talking about how we used to have leaks and, and, and the such in back in Egypt. So we're not longing for the days, before, mm. but we're recognizing that we're going with God. So that was my, my super big takeaway. That's good. From all of this. I love it. And, you know, to tie it back into the beginning of our conversation, I think that's where the rubber meets the road. Uh, when mm-hmm. you think about what John MacArthur is facing, I don't, I, you know, because you've probably seen my videos, I don't say that every church has to do the same thing. But what right. I appreciate is that he wants to be, he wants to be faithful. He wants to be faithful. And I think that is the most important thing for each and every one of us as Christians right now, is that we are truly saying, Lord, this culture sometimes is more than I can even wrap my head around. But I'm going to get my eyes off of that, and I'm going to set them upon you. And I'm asking you, Lord, to show me the right way to proceed. And uh, I think if we as Christians do that, we'll be more unified, which would be a wonderful thing to see, wouldn't it? (laughs) Absolutely. And this, uh, you said that. I love that you mentioned that unity because we we're hearing that uh, the clamors for unity for the last couple weeks um, after the election and the stuff like that. <laughs> and I, I think we should be unified. I think we should be unified around truth, around mm-hmm. the scriptures, around Christ, not around just oh well, I disagree with people who wear Florida Marlins hats and Florida Marlin hoodies, I should just get over it. <laughs> oh, now we're, now we're unified. Um, I should just get over it. Oh, well, the fact that the guy still supports the Marlin. I mean, I'm using that as a very, very, <laughs> just a very generic example. But I mean, there's like, when there's bona fide issues and, and differences, if we're not willing to come back to the, to the gospel, back to the cross, then we don't have unity and we, we need to realize that and recognize that we, we can't have unity outside of Christ. Everything else, anything else unifying outside of Christ is just fleeting. It's not going to last. Amen. Not and and, and, not and speaking of my hat, now I know why you were uh, thinking about sending me an Atlanta Braves hat. Uh, you, you want me to unify with you. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Somebody, one of your viewers is going to send you an Atlanta Braves hat. But if not, I got you for Christmas. Okay. One of them yeah. is going to send you an Atlanta Braves hat. I, I know. I, I, I'm just so encouraged. And as we kind of wind down our conversation, I just, I hope people can see that, you know, J- Jason and I haven't even known each other that long. But there's a unity we have, and that unity comes through the Holy Spirit and through Jesus Christ, and it is a unity that the culture tells us. I mean, let's face it. You and I have very different backgrounds. The culture would say, you can't be unified. Mm -mm, You have different backgrounds. Well, through Jesus Christ, we are brothers. We are one. Absolutely. And I think that's the the what we're and we could turn this into a whole nother show and that and that we will (laughs) but (laughs) don't do it don't do it because you know i've already had all my coffee i mean at another time yes (laughs) but yeah that's the point like we we don't have unity in anything else and anything else we can't have unity in so therefore we only have our unity in christ and that's the thing that We've, we've mentioned it before, is some kind of faux unity under any other banner, faux unity under any other type of uh, circumstances. is not going to last. But again, we see unity in Christ, and that's the thing that will last. So I'm extra glad to, to have met you. I'm extra glad to be able to make, have these conversations and parse through these things and see if we can make some sense of them. That's great. I look forward to more conversations and I appreciate that you accept me even though I'm wearing a Marlins hat. That's okay. We're going to switch you up and get your hat soon enough. 
Thank you so much, Jason. Hey, no problem at all. Thank you, my friend. Take care. Take care.